Greetings and welcome to our video service for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost coming to you from Trinity Episcopal Church in Lumberton, North Carolina. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Our Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. For much of Christian history, being identified as a disciple of Jesus uh, has been considered uh, high praise. The disciples, after all, were the hand-picked group of followers who lived and learned and labored uh, along with Jesus, and they were commissioned to heal the sick, and baptize sinners, and to proclaim the good news of God and Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. But if we listen closely, we can't help but notice that the scriptures do not always portray the disciples with such glamour and reverence. Consider today's reading. For the second time in Mark's Gospel, Jesus takes the disciples aside to teach them that he will soon be given over to human hands and will suffer and die and rise again. And for the second time, the disciples don't get it. In fact, Mark's Gospel tells of Jesus trying to teach the disciples this crucial lesson on three difficult occasions, and each time the disciples don't get it. Instead, they are concerned with things like which one of them is the greatest, and what folks in town thought about them, and even what were they going to eat for lunch. But what perhaps is the most perplexing of all is the fact that not only do the disciples fail to understand Jesus in his teaching about his suffering and his death and his resurrection, but they're also too afraid to ask Jesus any questions about it. And as maddening as the disciples' failure to understand or even ask questions with the hope of understanding. As bad as this may sound to us, how often are we guilty of precisely the same thing? How often are we afraid to ask a question because we think we should know the answer or because we're afraid that the question is stupid or because we're afraid of the answer? After all, if knowledge is power, then ignorance his weakness. But perhaps the disciples were afraid to ask Jesus a question because they should have been paying better attention. But maybe they were afraid to ask because Jesus would think they were ignorant or maybe they were afraid to ask 
Jesus a question because somewhere deep down they already knew the answer to the question. Jesus said the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. And Mark, with his characteristic briskness and brevity, doesn't reveal the expressions of the disciples' faces when they heard Jesus utter these words. He doesn't tell us about the horrified stares and the hard gulps. And he says nothing about the heavy hush that surely descended upon the disciples with this news. All Mark says is they were afraid. And although Mark is silent as to why the disciples were afraid, we can surmise that they feared for the fate of their friend and their leader. I mean, after all, each one of them had left their families and left their livelihoods to take the enormous risk in following Jesus. And so hearing that he expects to be arrested and killed, never mind a bit about rising from the dead, all of this comes as quite a shock. But what if the disciples were afraid for another reason as well? What if along with their fears about what would happen to Jesus, they were also afraid of what would happen to them? After all, if Jesus was arrested and killed, surely his closest associates would come under scrutiny as well. Perhaps what was at the root of the disciples' fear is the fact that they were beginning to understand, even just a little, what the true cost of discipleship is all about. In a world where wealth is good, but more wealth is better, where consumerism is king and where our worth is measured by what we have rather than what we give, the cost of discipleship is hard news that many would prefer not to hear. But of course, it is the good news that we desperately need to hear. A few years ago, Episcopalians from around the world gathered near Haynesville, Alabama to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Episcopal seminarian and civil rights worker and martyr, Jonathan Daniels, who was killed during the height of the civil rights movement in 1965. Jonathan Daniels' death came as a result of just pushing an African-American teenager named Ruby Sales out of harm's way when the two walked to a corner store on a hot day to buy a cold soft drink only to be met by an irate man pointing a loaded shotgun at them. The cost of discipleship was for Jonathan Daniels his very life. And as the disciples began to process their fear about what Jesus was teaching them, maybe they were beginning to realize that the heavy cost was one that discipleship would place on their own lives. These are, of course, I suppose extreme cases, but they make plain fact that we cannot confess the faith of Jesus Christ crucified and risen without coming to terms with the reality that discipleship places a claim on us. 
it will cost us something. And for some of us, it may cost us what is popular, and for others, it may cost us our comfort zone, and for others, it may even cost us our friends. Of course, there is an easier way. We could simply listen to Jesus' hard teaching about suffering and death and resurrection and continue on without asking any questions as if nothing had happened. But deep down in our bones, this path will leave us wanting. It will leave us to preach a half-hearted and watered-down gospel. A gospel that has more to do with being comfortable and complacent than the cross of Christ. Now the path of discipleship, if it is followed, is hard. It can lead us through suffering and even death and it can cost us dearly. But in the end, we will discover that it is this path that leads us to resurrection and to life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.